Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in everyday listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1 You will hear a woman who has just moved into the area talking to a neighbor about problems she is having in her house. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 2. Oh, hi Ruth. How are you? I'm sorry to bother you, Alistair, but I've been having some problems. Oh, come on in. What's happened? Basically, I had a leak from one of the pipes in the bathroom, and water started coming through downstairs, and the kitchen ceiling's badly stained. Uh... I've got the leak fixed temporarily, but I wasn't happy with the plumber, and I wanted to ask your advice. Of course. Well, the first thing I'd say is make sure you choose a local company. That way, if things go wrong, you're close by and it just makes things easier. Let me write this down. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. The plumber who fixed things yesterday was from quite far away, but I chose him because his advert said he did emergency repairs. Well, fair enough. You needed something in a hurry. But another piece of advice I'd give is try to avoid calling anybody on weekends. That'll really bump up the prices. Leave it till Monday if you can. Well, yes, I think I can do that because the temporary fix should hold. And obviously I'll need the ceiling plastered and eventually redecorated. Yes, yeah, sure. So who would you recommend? Is there a directory? Well, there's quite a good website covering this sort of work. It's www.plasteco.com. Is that with a K? A C. P L A S D E C O dot com. Got it. Well, I'll try and have a look at that. Yes, it gives price and quality comparisons. Oh, that'll be useful. But I find personal recommendations really helpful as well. You know, you can find out whether you can rely on the company. Well, I know a couple of reasonable plumbers and also some plasterers. Great! Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 3 to 10. There's a company called Peaks Plumbing. Now, they're a father and son team. They're really friendly and they tell you information you need in a clear way, you know, so they really understand what the problem is. Right. Well, that's good to know. Are they reliable? Well, that's a downside. Every single time I've used them, they arrive late. And friends have said the same thing. But is the work good quality? Absolutely. Another one is John Damerel Plumbing Services. He's very good. How do you spell the surname? D-A-M-E-R-O-L. Right. Got that. And does he do high-quality work? Well, it's fine, you know, but I wouldn't say that was his main point. Uh, basically, he comes out cheaper, you know, than other people. I sense there's a but. Is he unreliable? 
Oh, he comes when he says he's coming, but he's not very courteous, and he has the tendency to be messy. You know, so you have quite a bit of clearing up to do. Hmm. Okay. So it's up to you. They're both good workers, and they won't cheat you. Right. And you said you knew some plasterers. Yes, a company called Simonson Plasterers did our living room last year. We chose them because we wanted some fancy work on the ceiling, around the lights. So they can do a variety of designs. You've got it, but it comes at a premium because they are more expensive, you know. Than the others. Yes, or you could go for a one-man firm called H L Plastering, Harry Lester. He's fine, very reliable. If all you want is a simple job, do either of them do painting for you? If you want, after the plastering's dried out, of course. That's what I was going to say. But I should explain that Harry's quite old now, and so he avoids doing jobs which involve tall ladders. You know. But my kitchen isn't too bad for that. I'd have to ask him if he's prepared to do it. Yeah, sure. So I'll start by looking at the website. All those companies are on there, with their phone numbers, etc. Thanks ever so much. You were such a. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You will hear the education officer in a museum giving a talk to school students who are about to start a one-week work placement in the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, and welcome. We're really pleased that you're going to be joining us next week for your work placement. Now, each of you will already have met the member of museum staff assigned to supervise you. In this short talk today, I'll be giving you more general information, which will be relevant to all six of you. Your normal working day is nine to five p.m. But on Monday, because it's your first day, we'd like you to arrive at quarter to nine. Please note, though, that you'll finish at the usual time. A lot of you have been asking what you should wear for work. Well, you may have noticed that we're not exactly a formal institution, so you'd really be out of place if you wear smart attire like a suit. If you go out on a trip with us. Then we'd like you to wear a museum cap. It has our logo on, and we feel it helps people recognise you. But on a day-to-day -day basis in the museum itself, we say put on your own casual clothing, because you'll be doing lots of dusty, messy work. Now, we don't have an enormous number of rules, but work placement. Is an excellent preparation for the real world of work, and we expect you to be very punctual and reliable. If you're not well or there's been a hold-up, then what we ask you to do is ring the museum receptionist. He will be in the museum well ahead of opening time, and he'll inform your own personal supervisor in the museum. If you're away for more than one day, we'll inform your school tutor. They'll obviously need to make a note of your absence. And follow up if necessary. But most of all, we hope you really enjoy yourselves during the placement. Students say they have a lot of fun, whether it's working with kids in our art workshops held every Monday, or the most popular, when they go out 
on our outreach work to residential homes, recording elderly people's memories of school days for our oral history project. So, we hope you feel excited by the prospect of starting next week and well prepared. Your personal supervisor will be there to help you with our health and safety requirements when you start next week, and your supervisors will also brief you about the background to the museum, summarising all the huge amount of information on our website. In the next couple of days, it might be worthwhile if you get hold of evaluations and other notes made by students who've worked with us before. You can get a lot of pointers from them. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now, before I finish today, I wanted to help you find your way around the museum. When you start next Monday, the first thing you'll need to do is sign in. Come through the main entrance and you'll see the main staircase straight ahead. To the right of this is the statue of the horse and just behind that is a door. Go through that and that's the sign-in office. Now, on the first day, You'll be working in Gallery 1. You'll find this as follows. In the central courtyard area, close to the entrance, there's a large chest where visitors put donations for the museum. The door just behind that leads to Gallery 1. The workshop you'll be taking part in starts at 11, but if you want to go in earlier, you can get the key and let yourself in. The key box is quite hard to find. Walk behind reception and it's between the large gallery and the bookshop. I haven't mentioned breaks and um, lunch etc. Unfortunately our cafe's closed at the moment so your best bet is to bring a packed lunch. We tend to have our sandwiches in the kitchen area. Go round the reception desk and you'll see a small circular cabinet. The door to the kitchen area is just behind that. Now, every day, we put up notices about what's happening in the museum. Your supervisor will brief you, but if you want to check up on details, look on our staff notice board. This is in the corner of the play area, at the back, on the wall of Gallery 3. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear three students, Steve, David and Susan, discussing the different courses they attend. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Well, gentlemen, we've almost finished our second semester at this university. What do you think of all the courses we attend? On the whole, I'd say they're quite good, apart from social history, which I find to be a little too inexact. Yes, the lecturer's style is also very, very dull. I certainly agree with you there, although I would say that the textbook is more interesting. Welfare state, 
The subtitle says, An Examination of Social Development in the 20th Century. Yes, Welfare State is a good book, but look how many pages it has. 458! I agree. It's just too long to be easily read. Far too long, although it's certainly well written in parts. Yes, and if you compare it to the textbook for cultural studies, what's it called? Inner Views, I think. No, that's the book for media studies, and we finished that subject last semester. The book you're thinking of is In Perspective. Oh, sorry, you're right. In Perspective. And the subtitle says, A Comparison of Social Groups. Somewhat interesting, wouldn't you say? Well, mildly so, as is the subject, dealing as it does with such a wide variety of issues. But the book itself certainly oversimplifies a very complex subject. I agree. I also got annoyed at its constant oversimplification. Life is more complicated than what it suggests. Yes, but what you call oversimplifying may well be considered clarifying. Look at this other textbook, Government in Action. Some may say that it also oversimplifies, but it must do so in order to present a coherent picture of an equally complex subject. Government in action? Which subjects? It's the textbook for political theory. Oh, I hate politics. That's why I don't like the active leadership subject either. And most of the stuff in that political theory textbook is based on the American system. You see, it's written by Americans, so it's not even relevant to us here. I'd agree with you there. It's not relevant to us at all, since our government uses the Westminster system. Yes, I suppose that is a problem. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Well, it seems we all have certain criticisms about the textbooks we're using, but at the same time, we all like some elements, at least, of the subjects we're studying. What's your favourite subject, David? I'm not sure. I like political theory, but... Cultural studies is by far the best, even better than political theory, which I also like, but just not as much. Why do you say that, Steve? I was thinking perhaps social history is worth considering as best. Social history is good, but I made my choice because the subject is relevant to this modern society. But so is social history, and I like the historical element, which the other subjects lack. Even political theory examines history only briefly, and in a very narrow way. So I'd say social history is the most rewarding for me. What about you, Susan? I think social history is certainly very good, but political theory is, in fact, the best, since basically every human system boils down to politics. So, despite a certain irrelevancy in the details, the basic message remains as relevant as ever. Oh, Susan, you can't be serious. Let's ask Olive again. She's over there. Olive! Which subject do you think is the best? Ah, a difficult question. I'm very interested in culture, so cultural studies is certainly my cup of tea. But I'm politically active also, and hope to pursue this as a career, so political theory would be the one I'd pick. I don't believe it, even with that irrelevant textbook. Don't listen to him, Olive. You have a right to your own opinion. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the movement of population towards cities. First, 
you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. If you consider the farms of old, the type your father or grandfather grew up on, they were small and labour intensive, requiring lots of workers. In addition, they often had a diversity of products, be that animal or vegetable, say cows and sheep, or oranges and lemons, with some peaches and a few chickens on the side for the production of eggs. The many workers involved raised their families who needed products and support services, such as medical clinics and schools, so the small country towns had mercantile activity, storefronts and community participation with all ages present and a distinct town culture. And how it has changed. Travel to any small country town in virtually any developed country and you will often see that these places are now somewhat forlorn and deserted, lacking life and vigour. Many of the residents have long since moved towards the big cities, so the country areas have become depopulated and their downtowns empty. This phenomenon is so predictable and widespread that it even has a name, rural flight or rural exodus, and it has produced some fairly predictable problems. As for the causes of rural exodus, the most obvious is the industrialization of agriculture. This comes in two aspects, one of them being monocultural farming practices. What this means is that it is now more efficient to have one product and focus on its needs almost exclusively. So, for example, animal husbandry will usually involve a single type of animal, say pigs but with huge factory farming techniques, or, in other words, the second aspect, economies of scale. This means instead of 200 pigs, there'll be 2,000, tightly fitted into small pens or cages, with high density waste disposal and automatic feeding systems. Yet, despite this huge size, it can all be controlled by just a dozen farm workers pushing the right button. You might not like it, but in a competitive market, the cheaper the overheads, the better, and one can't argue with market economics. It's simply the way of the modern world, and it has changed the face of rural districts, mostly for the worst. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. We can talk at length about the problem of rural exodus, but what about solutions? Well, there is certainly some cause for hope, since many are now feeling the negatives of increasing urbanisation, negatives which the countryside generally does not have. Thus, tourism, for example, is certainly one avenue of revenue and revitalisation. The most important consideration here is that the local residents themselves participate in developing such initiatives and deciding what happens, since outsiders, be they state government or city-based planners, do not fully understand the local settings, the possibilities which may be on offer, or the town culture, since even small rural areas can be highly distinctive from neighbouring ones. For example, the Dalesford area has developed a tourist industry based on the natural springs there, putting forward the angle that this water is relaxing and revitalising for the health. 
There has been the development of spas, saunas and small-scale accommodation within its picturesque hillsides. And another solution is to utilise the predominant local product. This takes advantage of the fact that many city people are developing a dislike for factory produced and packaged foodstuffs. They are becoming interested in products that can be sold directly to them at a cheaper price while preserving all the freshness from the tree or animal. It is important here that the country area is not only characterised by a specific product but markets this idea well. For example, Many areas of country Victoria have developed widespread grape growing and wine making facilities and encourage wine tasting tourism, now a thriving industry with an international patronage. Similarly, Harcourt is famous for apples, Shepparton for mature cheeses and Mildura for its citrus products. Such strategies, done well, give hope that rural areas can revitalise somewhat and once again be lively and interesting places to live in. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing us topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking you got guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material visit my official website www.ieltsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material then please join my telegram channel. So guys please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.